Hi gang, K.R. King here helping you homebrew your own D&D campaign. So this is a continuation of my series on the Dungeon of the Mad Mage Level 1, where I look at the dungeon in order to mine tips for creating your own dungeons in terms of the geography of the dungeon, the layout, but also, you know, the NPCs, the monsters, and the puzzles that are there. So today I'm going to look at an area of the dungeon that I call Halister's Calling Cards. These are rooms that show different aspects of Halister's, you know, control and manipulation of this complex. And this is the first chance the players get when exploring, you know, the Mad Mage's complex to experience Halister's twisted and deadly sense of humor and to appreciate the scope of his power. And I think these examples provide an excellent blueprint for you to create your own supervillain as mad, bad, and dangerous to know. All right, so as always, if you want more information on this level, uh, check out the videos that I made uh, earlier, the first part of this level one dungeon, but also a video I made on the overall setup of the Mad Mage's dungeons. So today I'm gonna look at areas nine, 12, 14, 17, and 19, and rooms 13, 15, 16, and 18. Now, while I would include rooms 10 and 11 as part of this, you know, section I call Halister's Calling Cards, I already covered them kind of in depth in the earlier video. So quickly, room 10 is filled with these skulls of Halister's victims, you know, adventurers that went here, they, they spill out to freak out the players. And then a room 11 has this throne, kind of a puzzle, very fairly simple puzzle, and it gives away a wand of secrets, which is kind of a useful item for finding secret doors. So the key here is when we're looking at the you know geography of these zones is to think about what it's like as a player when you're exploring, when you're moving down these hallways and going into these rooms. And you know the first thing you notice just looking at this map in terms of its geography, there's only one way to get into this section, that's room 8A. That means going through the Undertakers, who I uh, detailed in this earlier video. And it has a further distinction that it is a dead end. There's no way to get anywhere else in the dungeon uh, except through rooms 8A. No exits to go to another level or to get outside. Now you do have these two sort of extended tunnels with, you know, the graphics here the, that say uh, these could be used for extended dungeons. But I'm going to take care of that right away. I'm just going to fill these in with rubble, uh, much like these other dead ends. The reason is that I want to think about this dungeon as defined by the text so that I can learn from its construction. And two tunnels that just lead to some undefined area kind of cloud that process. Because when you just start creating additional hallways and rooms and start filling them up with monsters, you risk creating outcomes that could uh, distort or interfere with those that were expected by the designers when they thought up, you know, the challenge ratings and the access. So having to pass through at least areas six and eight means the players are going to have to confront the Undertakers. Either they're going to have to defeat them in battle or pay a fee to pass by, which of course means on their way back, since there's no other access, they're going to have to deal with them again. But for this example, I'm going to assume that the players have defeated the Undertakers and the Flesh Golem, and they are in this hallway number 12. So here they see 12 statues, life-size statues of warriors. They see webs overhead and three dead spiders that were killed by the Undertakers. And this area has nothing really of interest except for that. So let's say the players go west from here, which is into area number nine. Again, the text says there's not much of interest here. These are plundered halls. You've got some pillars, uh, an old corpse, uh, and a rusty old set of armor, but again, nothing of interest. And what this does is it tells the players, hey, you're on level one. There have been adventures here. There's going to be areas that have been plundered. And this is something you can do when you're building your own multi-level dungeon. You know, the players have to go deeper to get more treasure. Plundered rooms lend realism. So if the players continue down this hallway to the south, they'll run into the, you know, room of skulls. And then in room 11, potentially the wand of secrets. Notice here you have a room with a secret door. Assuming that's one way, uh, the players could use this room especially if they've had a big battle with the Undertakers, they could use it for a short or long rest. So the lesson here in terms of your dungeon construction is to have some rooms uh, where the players could conceivably take a long or short rest. As I said, a secret door is an excellent choice. So the players could go east initially, or when they go down to 10 or 11, there's nothing there. So they come back and they go east, and they go down this corridor to room 13. 
just a 15 by 15 foot room, nothing special, except as the text suggests, you could use this room to display some of Hallister's regional effects. These are not horrifically deadly, but they are unnerving to the players. The one I like the most is a ghostly one foot diameter eye uh, that Hallister can see through. And the thing about this eye is it can turn right in 100 or 360 degrees. And by turning with the player's move or whatever, it's obvious that whoever's behind it uh, can see them and is acting on their movements. The other thing that I would suggest is perhaps to have a little audio thing from Hallister, uh, you know, welcoming them or saying you're going to die. I don't know. Just something so that perhaps the players can see, oh my God, it's Hallister and he's watching us. And then the other thing that they have, you know, minor illusion, kind of, you know, clanking of chains or moaning or all sorts of creepy sounds. And then this final effect where you have these apparitions of the dead adventurers who died there, presumably their souls or something are still trapped there. You know, they just kind of walk through the walls. They don't interact with the players at all. And I'm thinking with this effect, you could possibly have someone that the players recognize. Maybe someone from their youth or being in the army, maybe some noted citizen they met as a kid, whatever that is, to see, oh my gosh, that's someone I know and their spirit is here. Just an illusion, but very effective. All right, so continuing on, we have the area 14, a couple of rooms here, and I feel like this is classic Hallister, his devilish nature, where he uses the adventurer's inherent greed to kind of mess with them. So in 14A, the floor begins to slope very sharply so that as you go down this hallway, by the time you get down to 14B, it's down 20 feet. And in 14B, you've got an eight foot statue of a Sagan Baron. He doesn't have a trident, instead he's holding a locked box. And then overhead covering every area of the floor is a floating disc covered in acid. You know, there's nothing else of interest. There's a secret door, but inside this room, nothing. So the lockbox is not part of the statue. It's clear that it is separate and potentially could be taken out. But of course, players are going to know if you move this box, this acid is going to fall on us. Now, there is a key to this box. It's in room 6C, uh, hidden with the bandits. So there's a if they've defeated the bandits and they've searched the room, they may well have found this key. But do you want to walk up under this acid and open the box with the key? Now, that is the secret. If you open it any other way, the acid falls. So this acid does 2D10 to everyone in the room initially. It's five feet deep. And every turn that you start in the acid, you take additional damage. It's slowly, I think it's one foot a turn, drains out of little holes. Now you could say, okay, we're gonna pry this box out of the Soggins' hands, take it out of this room from underneath the acid. But of course, the minute you do that, it comes to life. Check out a Soggin Baron's stats. They have this blood frenzy where they you know, fight with advantage uh, and anyone who has any hits on them, they're, they're very nasty. So, you know, you've got your player options. Obviously, if you've got the key, do you want to open it underneath? Even though that's the secret to it, are you going to trust that? Maybe you have the key, you still say, I'm prying this out of here. So you fight the Sagan, you take some damage, you go out in the hall, you open it, you see, oh, nothing happens. Or you go out in the hall, you don't have the key, you throw a knock, uh, it opens, but because it wasn't open with the key, the acid falls. So after all that, you look into this box and you see a withered heart. So do you use, you know, detect magic or just identify? It says in there that you can identify, if you use that, you can identify the properties of this. In theory, if you didn't have these spells and you just, you knew it was magic and you didn't have it, you could just attune to it. But I don't think players are going to be quite that reckless. And if you identify the properties it says come to light, Basically, what well, this is the heart of a tiefling that Hallister killed. It's all withered. If you attune to it, instantly this heart goes into you, kills you. Your heart goes into the box and becomes withered and rotten, and then it performs the same function. Total screw job. So you either got blasted by acid, which is probably unlikely with experienced players, fought a Sagan Baron, took some damage, or you had to use a second level knock spell, you know, a tech magic and identify all for nothing. And you got this room over here that has the secret door. When you go to the hallway, if you've got the wand of secrets, do you use one of the three charges on that to find nothing? And once the players realize what's going on, I might have one of those regional effects. I might have Hallister give out a <laughs> low little chuckle of satisfaction or even a remark. All right, so the players could rest up in 14C here with the secret door if they've taken damage. You know, I think, again, are they going to be continually taking shorter, long rests? I don't think so if they've just taken one. Okay, 
So they go down here to room 15 and they find nothing but a ordinary hand axe and a sharpening wheel that's broken. Another looted room because you're on the first level. So then we have a double doored entrance to room 16 and we have the first of the elder rooms. Now I went over these in my video on the setup of the Mad Mage, but basically the Elder Runes are set there by uh, Halister and they have these Bane or Boon effects. And the effect can occur the first person that passes by the rune, or it could be the third or fifth. They also say in there you could have multiple people. I tend to think maybe one at a time is good, especially on this first level. So I'll just do one randomly. You know, they suggest you could just do a random Bane or Boon, you know, so I'll say you know, even is Bane, odd is Boon on a D6. So on this card, you have the, let's say, one player, the first to pass by, has to make a constitution save on 20 D6 force damage. You know, that's an average of 70 points on one failed save. Deadly. But if you look at the boon of this card, you either get all of your expended spell slots up to 6th level, or if you don't have any expended spell slots, or don't have any slots, you get this magic uh, resistance effect against all attacks for one hour. And here again with the Elder Rune, I might have a regional effect of Halister sort of, you know, snidely making a remark for a Bane, or, you know, saying, aren't, aren't I generous to give you this boon, but, you know, be careful, my friends. And here's the thing, the players are being introduced to the villain Halister in various ways, some super deadly, some just sort of irritating. If you're creating this villain from your own imagination, they have no idea what to expect. It slowly dawns on them that this is some powerful entity behind this whole dungeon. All right, so after the players make it past the Elder Room on the double doors to Room 16, they go in here and they encounter the creature that's on the introductory page of this level. In fact, they encounter three of them, Manticores. All right, and as I discussed in my intro video, the rule of thumb on this dungeon is all the rooms have a ceiling at least as high as the width of the room. So this room is 60 feet wide. That means you have a 60 foot tall ceiling. So why are there manticores in this room? Are they just sort of waiting around for someone to show up like Dungeons of Old? No, they have a reason. Halister has put them there. He feeds them so that they'll stay there. And then, you know, hanging out here, they're always able to, whatever wanders by adventures or whatever, they get to, you know, add to their diet. And of course, with a 60 foot ceiling, they could start off, you know, maybe they have perches or something. They could be hovering and using their tail spike attack. You know, if the players start hitting them with ranged weapons or ranged spell attacks, they're probably going to close an encounter, you know, and just fight them that way. But again, when flying creatures come down, they engage anyone. Hear that, my wizard friends? So it's a tough battle, but you got a fairly decent treasure, a 250 gold piece uh, necklace with this bloodstone gem. If you have a room with an active monster in it, typically it's going to have its treasure, right? So you're the first to kill it, you get the goods. So the text says that after the players defeat and kill the manticores, a scrying eye appears and watches them for one minute. Again, if you want to have the regional effect with Halister talking to them, you don't have to, you don't want to overuse that. But just maybe after they've had an initial encounter with some, you know, a regional effect, when they see that scrying eye, they know Halister's tracking them. All right, so in room 17, more interesting stuff, the desiccated corpse of a basilisk, and then farther inside you have some of its petrified victims. Uh, if you investigate the uh, corpse and disturb it, you got two giant centipedes that attack. These are always nasty because of the old poison bite. So the basilisk is clutching a drift globe, which is, you know, can be a very useful item. You get a light spell anytime you want. It kind of drifts along within 60 feet. But once a day, you get a daylight spell. You never know when you have to dispel a darkness. All right, so then you have this little blocking area right here in the middle of after the basilisk, which I think is a nice feature and something to think about when you're creating your own dungeons. Because, you know, they don't know what's going to come around from behind. Uh, potentially provides cover, whatever. It's, it's just a nice feature to think about. So moving inside, at one time, there were six statues in each of these alcoves. Five have been smashed, one remains, and it's glistening black. That's because a black pudding with 120 hit points has been put in stasis on this statue by Halister, and it comes to life if it's either, you know, touched or, you know, harmed by anything in any way. Now, when as a player, I always hated black puddings because they dissolve non-magic weapons and armor. Uh, 5e has lessened it a little bit, but if you hit one of these... Uh, with a non-magic weapon, each time it goes down minus one, and at minus five, it's useless. Minus one to hit. 
Armor the same way, minus one each time the black pudding hits you in its AC. If it gets down to AC 10, no good. You know, so maybe a fifth level party in your world is loaded down with magic weapons, but if they're not, they're gonna potentially lose their, you know, main striking weapon. So you got some treasure in this room, uh, 75 gold pieces, but you also have these, I think it's like 12 petrified figures, six of which are identified as adventurers. And this is always an interesting thing. Yes, a greater restoration is a fifth level spell. It's going to be hard to get. But if you see someone, you know, very unusual, you know, an eight foot tall petrified figure human with strange features, you know, is it an elder or, you know, maybe a petrified copper dragon that was petrified in human form? You know, maybe it has a map or some scroll or something in its hand that you can only partially see. You might, you know, take back the different, investigate, try to figure out who it is, and it might be worth getting a greater restoration. So in room 18, we have a troll that's been charmed by Halister. Uh, it, it feeds the manticores. Each day it goes down uh, to room 19A where he has magically produced rotting meat. Uh, the troll eats its fill and then it goes in and it feeds the manticores. And these rooms, all the, the area 19, these are all feast halls. I presumably built when the dwarves built these halls long, long ago. Not much here. There's a tub worth 25 gold pieces. There's a corpse of a dwarf that has a, a burglar kit that you can take. You know, and that's the dead end. At this point, you're going to have to make all your way back to room 8A, continue to explore the dungeon. As I said, when I'm designing dungeons, I don't really like to leave these hanging areas. I like to connect them. You know, and also, if you look at room 25A to 25B, the goblins and bugbears made a tunnel here. Why to avoid going through the Hall of Mirrors in room 21? Well, why couldn't somebody tunnel through 32A to 19C? Or you could have the old secret doors shortcut, you know, walled tunnel. So there you have the area I call Halister's Calling Cards. So in the next video, I'm going to go over the last section where we've got more bugbears and goblins. We've got some gricks. Uh, we've got some were rats, flaming skulls. And of course, we have these stairs that go down to level two. But until then, if you like what you've seen, please subscribe to my channel. I'm always looking for more. Leave some comments because I love to read them and answer them. But of course, most importantly, my friends, Keep playing D&D &D and tell somebody else about it.